Hello, my most devout followers, and welcome back to the Celestial Perch. Today, I have the final conclusion video for the Covenant overviews. This one will be finally reviewing all four of them at the same time against each other, more so in like a tier list style, obviously, with the A, B, C, D, and F ratings as I've used before. It's not going to go in as much depth as that was kind of the point of the previous videos. This will just be more so a video to look at how I personally view them within single player. This will be exclusive to single player. A multiplayer would have slightly different ratings and if there's desire for that I can also create kind of my opinions against each other for multiplayer. It's a lot closer and they tend to just have more general use and you can avoid a lot of the downsides in multiplayer just due to the time frame. In single player you're going to be playing a lot longer and you're going to be experiencing a lot more of the downsides as well as a lot more of the benefits. So we're going to be looking at it from a single player lens. And looking at the A, B, C, D, and F, just a kind of quick overview, A is something that has a lot of powerful benefits or consistent benefits with minor downsides or downsides that are easily negated. Comparing that to something like B tier is just similar, but maybe not as powerful or slightly harder to deal with downsides. C tier would be something with relatively even benefits and downsides. D and F being uh, just kind of the opposite of A and B, where D tier, the downsides start to outweigh the benefits, but can still have potential. And F tier being something where it's either very difficult to make use of the benefits, or the downsides are just too crippling to manage. And as you can see here, none of them land within the D to F tier, at least in my opinion. They all have some benefit, and the downsides are manageable. We can go ahead and jump in and start with C tier and work our way up. So, looking at our first covenant, the one in C tier, this will be the Eater of Worlds. The Eater of Worlds, as shown on the screen, is focused around your army damage, your ship fire rate, as well as naval capacity and other benefits like your building will give you reduced ship upkeep, increased weapons range, and your leader has the potential to either give you a really powerful admiral or a pretty nice governor or ruler. So it does have some nice benefits here. The reason why the Eater of Worlds is within C tier is just due to their either really punishing downsides or really hard to deal with random downsides. And looking at their static downside of increased army and ship upkeep by 100 or 200%, in multiplayer, this can be punishing, but can be worked around. And a lot of the times you can be at war almost all the time. In single player, in my opinion, which is what this is kind of based around, I've run into an issue, or at least a more common experience on 3.7 and 3.8, where a lot of the times, especially on Grand Admiral, when I find the AI around year 30, or sometimes even earlier, they will be within an Overlord Agreement, or they will be within a Defensive Pact. A lot of the times the Advanced AI will just vassalize all the AI around them, and it can make it really difficult to attack people early. And sometimes it's just not beneficial to be at war, and then you'll be dealing with that army upkeep, as well as the 7 and 15% fire rate respectively, probably won't be enough within that year 30 to year 40 to attack somebody who has, you know, two additional neighbors that are within a defensive pact. So it really just doesn't have enough oomph in the situation where you need it. And in the situation where you are just kind of in a one-on-one -on -one against the Grand Admiral AI, and they are not part of a defensive pact or part of an overlord agreement, a lot of times it's just going to be overkill, as if you are in a one-on-one, -on -one, you can use your superior ship set and hopefully your superior economy just to just outproduce them and take them over rather quickly. So it just kind of falls into this not useful when it needs to be situation, and that's kind of unfortunate for the Eater of Worlds, as well as the random drawback that will occur every 15 years is kind of crippling as shown here on the screen there's a 15 percent chance for your highest level leader to die and with the current leader situation slash powerful benefits you can get from your leaders losing your highest level leader can be especially crippling so i think pairing all of those things together in single player puts it kind of in that c tier where the building is still a rather powerful 
the specific leader is still rather powerful the tech itself is not great but all of these things together kind of level out to a nice c tier ranking now moving on to the b tier we have two the whispers in the void covenant and the composer of strands covenant in my opinion these two both have benefits that outweigh their downsides or are at least more powerful than their downsides and in the case first of whispers of the void anything that will benefit your tech is extremely powerful in stellaris as tech is sort of king and monthly influence code uh, code breaking and cloaking strength are also just nice benefits on top of that and a lot of people kind of are immediately taken aback when they see reduced stability and reduced unity but in my opinion those things are relatively easy to manage and for an empire that should have a lot of base unity, of course losing percentage is not great, but it still shouldn't put you to a point where you're uh, worried too much about your unity production. The building you get from the Sanctum of, or the Whisperer's Covenant is not particularly amazing, uh, but at least the leader here, you have some pretty nice options. You can get a lot of research from your scientist, and you can get some pretty interesting admiral benefits with 40% extra evasion. The downsides uh, from the random downsides, this is where it kind of gets annoying as you have the highest percentage chance for a leader with a psychic trait to die, 25%. And you also have a 45% chance that the leader with the psychic trait gets the substance abuser trait. So it can kind of throw off uh, your leaders in more of a punishing way, but I think it kind of offsets it where the other, you know, the stability and the monthly unity are quite easy to play around and the research and just the research from your telepaths are so powerful that it kind of puts it more into the B tier and is overall, in my opinion, a relatively solid covenant. And then looking at the other B tier covenant, this would be the Composer of Strands, getting extra pop grow speed, leader lifespan, and percent pop grow speed from telepaths gives you an interesting playstyle where the earlier you can get this, you'll get a lot more pops to work with. And reducing your organic species trait picks is probably the least punishing of any of just the static downsides. As a lot of the times you will be psychic, or you or sorry, you, you will be spiritualist, and you will not be focusing on adjusting your species too much, at least in the early game. So this won't really punish you too much. As well as you have a pretty nice building to work with. Resources from jobs, empire-wide, and extra habitability, not bad. And then you can get some pretty interesting governors and rulers from the Chosen of the Composer. Leader capacity, leader experience, leader lifespan, all of that's rather nice. As well as pop growth speed and resources from jobs from the governor. Very nice as well. Uh, the Composer of Strand's downside is kind of interesting to work around. I would say gaining or losing random traits is something you have to consider if you're building a very specialized species the composer of strands is probably going to drop down to the c tier as if you're playing something that you cannot afford to lose trait wise or do not want to lose then this can be kind of annoying or something that you just don't want to work around like losing aquatic can be very crippling or just very annoying so if you're playing that specific type of build, maybe avoid Composer, but I think if you're just going for a generalist, powerful empire, and you're using kind of a general template for your species, it's definitely a B tier patron in my mind. And lastly, looking at the only covenant or patron within the A tier, for me, this is one that has very powerful benefits and almost completely ignorable downsides. That would be the Instrument of Desire, giving you 5% resources from jobs and extra amenities from your telepaths unlocks a extremely powerful generalist build where whatever you're going for, be it aggressive playstyles where you're using lots of ships to attack your enemies or just kind of turtling, chilling back, anything you're doing, even role playing, having extra resources from jobs and getting the ability to replace entertainers or other amenity producing jobs with a job that you're already going to build being the telepath is an extremely powerful game plan as well as the building that we get from the sanctum of the instrument is quite nice happiness and extra trade value not bad and the instrument leader you can have some interesting play styles around trade stability 
and a very, very powerful admiral as well. The downsides here being your pop upkeep is something that you can kind of ignore for the most part. People tend to confuse pop upkeep and job upkeep. Pop upkeep isn't something that will really cripple you too much as it's just food and consumer goods. And then your instrument of desire downside will require a advanced or strategic resource for up to two for two years. It will always be a resource that you own, so it can't be something you don't have access to and will cripple your economy, so that's nice. And the thing is, that's it. Whereas the other ones, you have a percent chance to get something random, and it can really mess you up by killing a ruler, or maybe crippling one of your planets for 10 years. This is just an upkeep. So remember, you have an already beneficial economy, so you can hopefully shore up whatever upkeep you get for this, or you might already be producing something like unity and getting a unity upkeep on some of your pops is kind of annoying but remember this scales with your pops but so so do your outputs so if you have a ton of pops and all of a sudden oh no you know they're costing extra unity well you're also producing a lot more unity than you were in the first 20 years of the game it's really something that a lot of the times i'll see the pop-up come up and i won't notice or it just won't really affect me but if i lose my highest level leader that can be crippling so the Instrument of Desire has the least uh, just punishing downsides and just the easiest playstyle of the four. It's hard to mess up resources from jobs and the downsides are also almost completely ignorable for the most part. And that's why in my mind, it is the only covenant that falls within the A tier and is the only one that I would just kind of pick regardless of what playstyle I'm going for. But thank you for listening and tuning in. I do have a few other videos coming out soon. I've been on vacation for the past week or so and have been kind of just taking it easy. But now that I'm back working and don't have as much stuff to do, I'm going to continue pumping out some videos. And another reason why I have been producing too many videos is they just keep releasing patches for this game. And I have a different strategy from some YouTubers. I, I know plenty of people like to do reaction videos, but there are so many of those that I'm trying to do more just specialized videos things that I kind of learn that want to pass on to people, or just specific builds that I like playing. The issue is for me to do those, I have to have knowledge of the game. And because they keep re like releasing new patches and I keep having to relearn and play things, and so much is changing, it's hard for me to be able to confidently like, re like release a build and say, yes, this is powerful, or this is fun, or this is, you know, interesting, when I have only played it once. So the next build that I have coming out is a heavy focus on a leader-based economy with, within the early game, uh, still focusing on being able to have a serviceable fleet around year 30, but it should be out here hopefully within the next week or so, and it will hopefully be interesting to most people. But thank you for your continued support and watching the videos. Uh, it means a lot to me. It's always fun to read the comments, so continue to comment and subscribe, of course. But thank you, and have a blessed day.